God promises us, when we put our trust in Jesus, to give us a brand new life, a whole new life. And yet so many people struggle to lay hold of that new life. God's given us two things, two amazing things to help us live that new life. And that's what we're going to talk about today on the program. Hi, I'm Bernie Diamond. Welcome again to Christianity Works, as today we head into the final message in this four-part series called Meet the New Me, because indeed God does want to give us a new life. Over these last few weeks, we've seen that you and I have been created in God's image. God, in Genesis chapter 1, created the whole shoot and match, the whole universe, and the picture pinnacle of his creation in verses 26 and 27 is us, you and me, humanity. God said, let us make humanity in our image. And in his image, he created us. Male and female, he created us. The powerful truth about your value in God's heart, your value in this world, is that it's not determined by what other people say. It's not determined by your status, your success, your abilities, your anything else. Your value is determined by the fact that you are made in God's image. As we saw in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he prepared beforehand for us to do. Problem is, though, that you and I have both wandered off. We've both turned our backs on God at some point. And so we're not worthy to live out our lives for him. Uh, back in, in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 12, Um, When Moses was up getting the Ten Commandments, the people were out creating idols, false idols, and worshipping that golden calf. This is what God said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people whom you have brought from Egypt have acted corruptly. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a metal image. If you read those first two commandments, it says you only worship God. You don't worship false images. You don't create idols. And and perhaps you don't have physical idols sitting in your bedroom or your lounge room or your, your office at work. But you and I, we are capable of making idols out of just about anything. My idols were success. My idols were status. My idols were reputation. My idols were wealth. Well, what are your idols? What have you worshipped other than God? Career? Family, I mean, you can, you can put your family ahead of God and turn it into an idol. An idol is anything that we put ahead of God. An idol is anything that we bow down and worship and sacrifice our lives to ahead of God. And so the truth is you and I have botched it up. You and I have, have effectively sprayed graffiti over that beautiful image of God that we've been created in and marred that image. The central Malady of humanity is sin. Not very popular to talk about. People don't want to hear about it. People laugh at me when I talk about sin as though that's some old, old-fashioned old religious mumbo-jumbo judgmentalism. But to God, sin is so important that he sent Jesus to die. To die, his son. Hands and feet nailed to a cross, brutally suffering, dying to pay the price that God's justice demands of my sin and yours. That's how important sin is to God. So let's not trifle, let's not sweep it under the carpet, let's not kid ourselves that, oh, God doesn't mind my little sin. Sin is sin. And that sin mars the image of God in us. But the good news is that God sent Jesus his Son. As we saw on the program last week, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, says that if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, everything is new. God came to give you a new life. God came to give me a new life. But as I said at the top of the program, so many people who believe with all their hearts in Jesus, 
struggle to lay hold of this new life. How do I get this new life? My life isn't all I, I want it to be. I know that I'm not living my life completely for Christ. How do I lay hold of that new life? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today on the program. Romans chapter 6, beginning of verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So Paul's saying here, when you and I believe in Jesus, when you and I believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are baptized by faith into that reality. Our old self dies with Jesus on the cross in the eyes of God. And, and just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so we are raised so that we can walk in newness of life. Can you never forget that? Romans chapter 6, verse 4, that God sent Jesus so that you could walk in newness of life. But I don't know about you, I have struggled sometimes to overcome the sin in my life, and the harder I tried, the more I failed. Have, have you had that experience too? Not just me, but uh, not just you, but also the Apostle Paul. He had that same experience. You can read about it in Romans chapter 7, where he says, look, what's the matter with me? I know the right thing to do, I just can't do it. In fact, the more I try to do the right thing, the more I find that sin lies close at hand. What's the answer? How am I going to overcome this? Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So there it is. It's the tussle between the flesh and the spirit, between the, the carnal man who wants to race off and do all the wrong things and the Holy Spirit in us. All too often as Christians, we set about trying to be a better Christian, trying not to sin so much, trying to follow the rules. But if you read the beginning of that chapter 8, God makes it clear that following the rules doesn't work. The rules are powerless to bring change. The only thing that can bring change is the Holy Spirit. So how do you and I lay hold of that change? And, and that's what God talks about here. He, he says, look, either you set your mind on the things of the flesh or the mind on the things of the Spirit. There's your choice. God isn't calling us to change ourselves. It's not our job. We can't. God's calling us to change our focus. You either set your mind on the things of the flesh or set your mind on the things of the Spirit. How do, you, how do you do that? How, how do you change from thinking about the things of the flesh to thinking about the things of the Spirit? Well, it's really quite straightforward. You and I, during the day, we think about things. And, and as I heard one preacher say, where the mind goes, the man follows. If you think about sexual immorality, that's where you're going to end up going. If you think about greed, that's where you're going to end up going. But if you think about the things of God, that's where you end up going. And I only know one way, one way to end up thinking about the things of God. I only know one way to set my mind on the spirit rather than on the flesh. And that is to be a man or a woman of God's word, to open the Bible, God's word, every day and let God speak to you. Over the past almost quarter of a century that I've been walking with Jesus, right from the beginning, I was blessed by a pastor, Pastor Phil, who taught me the power of God's word. And almost every day since then, not, not every day, but almost every day since then, I've opened my Bible and received the word of God. And, and I'm here to tell you that in this last quarter of a century, that one habit has been the most powerful thing in my life. It's taken a self-centered, egotistical, selfish, abusive man and through his word, the Holy Spirit's changed my heart. Because you know what? When you read the word of God, you, you think about it. It, it. That's what setting your mind on the things of the spirit is about. And the more you turn over God's word, the more you read, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. Um, the, the more you read, pray for your enemies. The more you read that stuff and you think about it, you go, man, 
That's God talking to me. That's, that's the creator of the universe talking to me. The more God changes you on the inside, it is not your job to change you. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Your job is to change your focus. Let's read it again. For those who live according to their flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. What do you want? Do you want death? Do you ultimately want to stand before God on that day of judgment and be sentenced to eternal death, eternal separation, eternal hell? Is that what you want? Or do you want life and peace? Do you want life and peace here and now? If you want life and peace, set your mind on the things of the Spirit, not on the things of the flesh. Because here's what happens. Romans chapter 8, verses 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you didn't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You see, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, since we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. God wants the best for you. You are his child. You are made in his image. When he looks at you, he sees himself. And he has sent his spirit into you so that his spirit would witness to your spirit that you are a child of God, that you can call him Abba, Father, Dad, and live in that life of peace and joy. How do you lay hold of this new life? Change your focus. Become a man or woman of God's word every day. Spend time in God's word. Read it, receive it, reflect on it, and respond it. Read, receive, reflect, respond. Let the Holy Spirit change you as he writes his word onto your heart. You cannot work harder at being a better Christian and expect that to succeed. That's the old way. That's the old you. Success in the kingdom of God means laying your life down for Jesus. And we only do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you believe in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. I just want to take a short break for a moment. The, the Word of God is so powerful. You know, when you read Genesis chapter 1 and you read Exodus chapter 20 and you read that stuff in, in Deuteronomy and Jeremiah that, that we just looked at, the Word of God is so powerful. And that's why I would love to send you a free copy of the fresh daily devotional each and every day. A truly powerful scripture verse together with some words of inspiration, hope, and encouragement delivered straight to you each and every day. You can receive it either as an e-devotional in your inbox or as a printed devotional. Just get in touch with us using the contact details on your screen right now. Uh, the web is always easiest, but please feel free to call that number as well. And we'll get you receiving the fresh daily devotional every day, the powerful word of God to transform your life. So if you'd like to subscribe, stop by our website. The details are on your screen right there. Pop in your name and email, and that fresh daily e-devotion will be ringing its way to your inbox every day. And when you do subscribe, you'll also receive a free copy of my e-book, How Can I Hear God Speak to Me? May you be blessed as you receive the Word of God into your heart each and every day. So we've talked about the Holy Spirit and, and, look, receiving the Spirit of God into your life. You know, the Spirit of God, when you believe in Jesus, actually dwells in your body. That's what the Bible says. So God himself makes his home with us. That's what Jesus promised. The Spirit of God dwelling in you. Restoring you back in the image of God. Do you know uh, Rembrandt painted a wonderful painting called The Night Watch? You, you may know it. Google it. Have a look. Um, you'll see it. It appears to be soldiers and whatever watching a city by night. But then they decided to restore the painting. You know how they, they restore famous paintings and they meticulously get the dirt off it and restore the colours and so on and so forth. And once the restoration was complete, they discovered that it wasn't a night watch at all. It was actually a daytime scene. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. 
The work of the Holy Spirit is to restore you and me back into the image of God. You have been created in the image of the living God. I have been created in the image of the living God. And yet sin has marred our lives. So God sends Jesus to suffer and die to pay the price that his justice demands for our sin. But Jesus didn't just die. That wasn't just the end of it. He rose again. That you and I might walk in newness of life. And it's that newness of life that we're talking about today on the program. Before the break, I said that there were two things that God had given us to help us actually walk in that new life, actually experience that new life. See, you and I have good things and bad things that happen in our lives. We have ups and we have downs. A new child comes into the world and we think that's wonderful. And then 14, 15 years down the track, you bring up a teenager and that can be a struggle, right? We have ups and we have downs. But God's joy and God's peace are meant to abide with us through all those ups and all those downs. God means for you to live in the newness of life through all those ups and those downs. So as well as his Holy Spirit in you to guide you, to teach you, to restore you back into your original image, God gives you something else through his Spirit. He gives you power. I don't know about you, but me, laying down my life for Jesus, being kind and gentle, sacrificing my life for others, those things don't come naturally to me. They might to you, but they don't come naturally to me. I don't have the power to turn the other cheek. I don't have the power to, to, to go the extra mile. If someone sues me for my shirt, I don't have the power to give them my cloak as well. I need power. I need Holy Spirit power to live the life that Jesus wants me to live. Truly, I tell you, if you want to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross and follow me. Anyone who tries to save their life will lose it, but anyone who loses it for my sake will gain it. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Being that sort of Jesus disciple, that sort of Jesus follower, takes power. How often have you gone to God and you said, God, please give me the power to deal with this difficult person? Oh, God, please give me the power to... The number of prayers that God must hear every day asking for power must shake his head because I'm here to tell you, you don't need to ask for power. God's already given you, in Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, all the power you will ever need to live the new life that he's called you to live. Don't believe me? Let's open our Bibles. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. This is the Apostle Paul writing to his friends in Ephesus. We're going to see what God says through him, God the Holy Spirit says through him, about the power that you already have. Are you ready? Let's do it. Paul writes, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So what's Paul praying for here for his friends in Ephesus? I don't cease to give thanks for you in my prayers. I ask that God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened so that... So Paul's saying, I want you to get a revelation. I pray that God would give you a revelation. A revelation of what? Well, of three things. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Whenever you read hope 
in the Bible. You've got to read it as certain hope because it's not an uncertain hope. It's not a I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow kind of hope. It's a certain hope. I pray that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. That the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you would see, so that you would know the certain hope to which God has called you. The second thing, the glorious riches of your inheritance amongst the saints. I want you to know not just the certain hope you have, but the amazing inheritance that's coming your way through Jesus. And the third thing, Paul wants us to know, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of his heavenly Father in heavenly places. God wants you to know the immeasurable greatness of his power towards you. See, Paul is not saying here, God, please give them more power. It's not what he's praying. He's praying, God, please show them how much power they already have in Jesus Christ. The immeasurable greatness of his power, the resurrection power, the same power through which the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Are you getting this? This is about your newness of life. We read earlier in Romans how we've died with Christ. Now we've been raised so that we can have newness of life by the Holy Spirit. Immeasurable greatness of power for those who believe. As a lecturer of mine, Barry Chant used to say at Bible college, if I were to transliterate those words from the Greek into the English, it would look something like this. The hyperbolistic, megathonic, dynamic power that you have in Jesus Christ. Are you getting this? This isn't just a little itsy bitsy bit of power. This isn't just a lot of power. This is the hyperbolistic, megathonic, dynamic power that raised Jesus from the dead. That power is available to you when you believe in Jesus. Here and now. Would you do me a favour? Would you do God a favour? Stop praying for power. Oh God, please give me power. Stop doing that. And start praying with power. Believe the power that you already have. Pray with boldness into Christ. We, we all get to points in life where we go, oh, I don't think I have the power. You do. The truth is that you do. Pray with boldness. Come boldly before the throne of grace that you may find God's help in your hour of need. So how do you and I lay hold of this new life that we have in Christ Jesus? If anyone is in Christ Jesus, there is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all is new. Well, here it is again. The first thing that we're called to do is change our focus. To get our focus off the flesh and onto the spirit. To get our mind off the flesh and onto the spirit. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. Let's go there again. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Become a man or a woman of God's word. Spend time in God's word every day. Read it, reflect on it, receive it, and respond to it. That one habit of being in God's word every day more than any other is going to fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit. It'll help you to set your mind on the things of the spirit and not on the things of the flesh. And secondly, start believing what God says about you and about the power that you have. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. I pray, says Paul, that they would know through a spirit of wisdom and revelation as they come to know you with the eyes of their hearts enlightened what is the hyperbolistic, megathonic, dynamic power, the immeasurable greatness of his power for those who believe, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, is the power that brings newness of life to you. When you focus on the things of the Spirit, when you believe in the power that you already have, let me tell you something, God is going to work mightily in you and through you to give you the new life that he promises us in Jesus Christ. It will not always be a comfortable life. It will not always be a convenient life. It'll be a life of sacrifice. It'll be a life of suffering. But it'll be a life in which you experience the glory of God in your heart. It'll be a life in which the image of God, you as his image bearer, will shine out through you. The glory of God, the love of God will pour out through you 
into the world around you because you are living the new life. Father, I pray for everyone, Lord, who's watching this program today. Lord, set us free from our past. Make us men and women of your word. Help us to focus on your spirit and stop trying to be better Christians. And Lord, help us to trust and believe that this power, this immeasurably great power that raised Jesus from the dead is the resurrection power that works in us to lead us into newness of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friend, God has an amazing plan for your future. God truly does to work in you and through you for his glory. Lay hold of that plan. Be the new you that God created you to be for Christ's sake. Well, that's all we have time for today. But before I go, I want to remind you about that booklet I've been telling you about over the last few weeks. It's called Your Complete Makeover Awaits. I would love to send you a free copy, but this is the very last week that it'll be available, so please don't miss out. Your Complete Makeover Awaits. Building on the teaching in this series with some life application questions at the end of each chapter to help you apply God's Word into the realities of your life. To request your free copy, stop by at our website or give us a call on the number that's on your screen right now and we'll send a free copy of that booklet out to you in the post. Your complete makeover awaits. I'm Bernie Diamond. You've been watching Christianity Works. Catch you again same time next week with another message of God's love, God's grace and God's power for each one of us in Jesus Christ.